scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast. Yes, it's the summer of Blake 7. And welcome. We've got 13 of these throughout, running all the way up to September. And you know what? Really not a bad thing at all. So, are you going to join me and do a lovely little rewatch? We're only going to do two a week. Go on, you can spare the time. You know you want to. There are, of course, other podcasts out there doing a Blake 7 rewatch down and safe i could heartily recommend and is particularly good they're working their way through every single one of the 52 episodes and good luck to them but they're going to be taking their time and me and you we've got a bus to catch so bear with me while we do a tiny little tin dog podcast reviewing blake seven also recommended would be neil and sue perriman's adventures with the wife and blake available on kindle But what, I hear you ask, is Blake 7 all about? And why all this fuss? Is there a particular anniversary on the way? Not really. Are members of the cast dropping like flies? Well, hopefully not. And yes, interest has been reignited because of Big Finish's lovely audios, which have made me more interested. And the fact that I got the DVDs for Christmas really hasn't helped either. So yes, I can lie in bed at night unable to sleep. No change there then. And watch remarkably good 1970s sci-fi. Blake 7. Well, let's look at it on paper. There's seven of them. Now, the opening titles, you've got a very nice, white, sleek-looking spaceship. Eventually, we'll know that's called the Liberator. And we know that there's going to be seven people involved. And we know it's about someone called Blake. That's all you know using mise-en-scene, which is basically posh for saying what's on your screen, what you see. Because everyone's always looking for clues and cues about what's going to happen. It's called Blake 7. You think there's going to be seven of them. You know it's going to be about a boat called Blake. And in the opening titles, you've got a really nice sleek white spaceship. Admittedly, it's been animated using still drawings and paper animation rather than a model. There will be photographs of the model. I'm sorry, I could go on at great length about how you shoot a sequence that looks like that. That's not important. First thing you also notice is the fact that there is an apostrophe missing from the S in Blake's 7. Now the apostrophe police don't belong round my house, mainly because as a dyslexic I'm just grateful that I can read words. And the fact that I desperately want to be a writer just proves how absolutely bloody-minded I am. But no, back to Blake 7. Blake 7 is what's going to be called a dystopian world. Now, at the moment, dystopian futures are kind of in vogue. But they've been in vogue for years. We've had post-apocalyptic landscapes. And yes, at the moment, it's zombies in some sort of strange post-zombie type world. And with survivors, you've got the whole world being wiped out by a disease. People will always look on the dark side. But in the 70s, you've got the guy who brought you the survivors going to the BBC and going, right, I want to provide a programme. Here's the pitch. It's the Dirty Dozen in space. Now, the problem with that is the fact that it's not really the Dirty Dozen. Well, I suppose it is in a sense. But if you've not seen the Dirty Dozen, that just makes it more confusing. The Dirty Dozen is a war film about convicted criminals who have either got life sentences or terminal sentences working for the government in order to take out some Nazis. I don't want to give away any more spoilers than that, but that's what that's about. There's a lot of banter. There's a lot of people with nothing to lose. And you know what? Although that's the pitch, it's not quite Blake 7. Blake 7 eventually will become something like Robin Hood in space. But again, 
they don't need the riches, and that's not what it's about. It's freedom fighters, but again, that's not what it's about either. It's an anti-Star Trek thing, but that's not what it's about either. It's about all of these things, and none of them. Yes, people can bring modern parallels, things like Firefly, where you've got a bunch of almost rebels on the run, but not quite on the run, but they're traders. Yes, they've got a psychic on board and that kind of thing, and we'll get to all of those things later. We are, of course, only dealing with Series 1 at the moment. 13 episodes of just loveliness. So Episode 1 is called The Way Back, and it involves a lot of story, which you never see on camera. They could make a prequel. But as if you saw a prequel, you would know what's happening, see Star Wars Episode 1, and you'd get a bit bored, see Star Wars Episodes 1 to 3, then that's not really needed. This story is great, but it's often seen as combining really well with Episode 2, Spaceful. That's what we'll be covering next time. But this time, it's Blake 7 and The Way Back. So what actually happens in this story? Now... For me, Blake 7 takes place in what I could only describe as a collection of dystopian ideas. It's as if somebody got my first big book of strange futures, my first big sci-fi book, and kind of ticked all the boxes without thinking things through. The government are bad. The government are bored and they've been in power forever. There is an establishment who rules everything. Again, sounds a bit like what we've got now. It sounds a bit like what we've had for a long, long time. Thinking that's how things are and that's how things will always be is a very dangerous assumption for both the people in power and the people not in power. People will often try and change things from within. Now you've got references to stuff like Brave New World where you've got the society with almost a caste system where you've got things like the alphas, the betas, the gammas, the deltas which are in Brave New World. Off the top of my head, I can't remember seeing any children in Blake 7. So, if Doctor Who annoys you because it's got too many kids in it, again, this is a reason to go and watch Blake 7. So the basic story, getting back on target, is that one guy, an alpha-grade technician, known as Rog Blake, is approached by two shady individuals. Imagine a Logan's Run-style world. Everybody's in a big dome. But, unlike Logan's Run... They all know of the existence of the outside world and they're just not allowed to go there. Perhaps not everybody knows about the outside world. If the world you live in is just one big building and there's no windows to see outside, then that's fine. Why is it a dome? Is it because it's controllable? People are doped up to the eyeballs. Now, admittedly, in a society like ours, we choose to medicate ourselves, which is a whole different kettle of fish. But here it's pumped into the water supply. Again, it's a 70s and 60s bit of paranoia about being controlled by governments. But as they put bromide in tea in the Second World War to control people's ardours, well, let's face it, the reality is still the reality. So yes, it's almost a dystopia by the numbers. It's got that big list of sci-fi clichés, and let's let's call a spade a spade here, or in spade a spade a shovel. One person's cliché is another person's meme. It's the same thing, a repeated idea that turns up time and time again. A cliché is seen as a bad thing. A meme is seen as something more... literate. They're basically the same thing. Stuff you've seen elsewhere turning up in order to fill the plot. A nation does write pacey stuff. There's a reason he was so rich and there's a reason he was so, well, popular. But Blake Seven is dark. It's not just fluffy, wonderful Doctor Who. It's kind of dark. The ideal person to write stuff like this would have been Robert Holmes, because it's dark with flashes of comedy, a bit like real life. So your basic plot is that Blake is approached by some shady characters and asked to pop outside for a chat with their friends. Admittedly, Blake 7 is remarkably slow by today's TV standards. But they go outside... They find their way and they're followed by someone called Tarrant. There are many characters called Tarrant in, well, the works of Nation. It's kind of a recurring gag amongst fans of this and Doctor Who that you'll always find someone called Tarrant somewhere. I'm sure there's a whole sketch written called Terry Nation Street, but that's, again, going off topic. Blake heads out of the city and towards a secret meeting. 
Now, this secret meeting has the token American slash Canadian in it. I think he's Canadian. And he's the sort of person you saw in lots of other programmes, i.e. someone who lives in England, but is definitely from another country in order to play those sort of characters, which means that people travel around the world still in the future. So they're not just limited to their domes. Now, in a totalitarian state, do they still use cash? Are things still about money? Well, eventually, of course, because there are criminals, you find out that there are cash-based cultures. So that's kind of just an extension of us. There are security cameras everywhere watching everyone's move. And because these days we're all used to it, we just sort of let that go and go, yeah, everyone's being watched. But in the 70s, security cameras were a kind of a new thing. They were an expensive item. I remember my first ever security camera that I was aware of. It was in Boots, the chemists, in central Newcastle, in the one in Eldon Square. I believe that opened in 1977, so it was around the time that this was on. And I was about five, and I was fixated on this. It would have been after 1977, because it bore a striking resemblance to the interrogation robot from Star Wars. And I remember being a bit scared of it, mainly because it looked like the interrogation robot from Star Wars. A big round black thing with cameras on the bottom. I'm not sure how many of them were real, and I'm not sure how many of them were fake, but it did rotate of its own accord. It was a scary item. And at the time, that sort of thing worried people being monitored. Of course, now people's mindset is more in the case of A, is anyone actually watching them? And the answer is usually no. And B, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, it's fine to be filmed. And yes, everyone's filming each other with Instagram and Facebook and Friendface and Prattle or Twitter, whatever it's called. But you get what I mean. Everyone's always reporting on each other. But then, in the 70s, paranoia in a kind of a 1984 George Orwell, again, ticking extra boxes kind of a way, was on the cards. So this is what we had. Blake leaves the city, goes to have his chat, and the authorities are not impressed. Blake finds out that he was once a massive political force, frowned upon by the other parties, and then he was taken away and brainwashed, and told everyone that he was wrong. And then they took him away again, wiped his brain once more, and told, and forgot, even that. And that is what is... And that is the Blake we have before us. A man who's down as a post-rebellion leader who knows nothing. He is just a technician. Imagine being told one day that you used to be somebody big. Now, some people don't recognise Blake. So although he was a political leader, not everyone's aware of politics. This is one of those things that if you think about or pay attention to, it just suddenly doesn't work. If someone is a leader of an opposition, most people should know what they look like to some extent. But then again, how many political leaders, especially in the UK, do you actually know by sight these days? Are politicians more and more faceless? Perhaps that's the way the future goes. So perhaps nation wasn't that far from the truth. Of course, the authorities turn up and decide to massacre everyone, all at the control of the Tarrant person, who is, of course, a traitor. You think he's a traitor and was dubious anyway. So that's what we get. Blake's arrested and taken away. His mind control begins to slip and snap, and he starts realising exactly who he was. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. Blake's now in a cell, and he decides to admit that he went outside. The powers that be, however, want him taken out of the picture for good. And they do something very 70s, without even knowing it's very 70s and very BBC. They accuse him of being a child abuser. This is exceptionally brave, and I think that if Blake 7 was brought back these days, no one would be brave enough to do this as an author. No one would be brave enough to say, yes, this man is a child molester. And it gets worse. Because although this is done in a kind of haphazard, offhand way, how they do it is awful. They take memories and insert them into children's minds. Now, A, where do these memories originate from and where were they recorded? So they must have existed somewhere. Does that mean that this abuse took place at the government's behest? And also, once someone believes something like this has happened to them, it's happened to them. So although the memory is of it happening via Rog Blake, it's actually by the government, by the society, by the person who is implanting the memories. 
no, physical abuse may have actually gone on. But that doesn't mean that the fact that the memory's there doesn't make it just as bad. Yes, there is some sort of legal counsel who tries to find out that these memories aren't real, but let's face it, as a piece of writing, it's incredibly well thought out. So Blake is now accused of this, the one thing guaranteed to write someone off from society. Just pay attention to any English tabloid newspaper. So as a society, no one is going to go, yeah, that Rog Blake, nice bloke, anymore. Of course, there's a whole ongoing thing about some people on Earth, and you think, as a reader, as a viewer, you're thinking, oh, these are the people going to be on Earth fermenting rebellion while Blake's off somewhere else doing that, and he gets sent to Cygnus Alpha. Also, interestingly enough, there is a justice machine. No decisions are made by anyone other than a computer. Yes, you've got the wisdom of Solomon, but you've also got programming going on. So this computer decides to send Blake off to Cygnus Alpha, a penal colony. Now, the existence of a penal colony in England was a bit rubbish because we sent them all the way to Australia, possibly in order to turn the country into an actual viable place. But why send someone to Cygnus Alpha? I suppose it's in order to store him for possible future use by some political government. An extra pawn later to be used, rather than just have the death sentence. Is it the impression of not having the death sentence? Or is it because someone would be... Or is it seen as a fate worse than death, being sent to Cygnus Alpha? But given the other people who go to Cygnus Alpha, that doesn't ring true either. That is for the next podcast. Blake eventually meets Villa and Jenna, a thief and a pirate, who are all being sent away to the penal colony of Cygnus Alpha. And that is what we'll try and cover in the next few podcasts. Because that was episode one of Blake 7. A tight, taut piece. Yes, there are some lacklustre performances, especially by Federation guards and Federation personnel, but you don't know if they're doing it on purpose to prove how deathly dull the society is in the future and how throwaway people are. What the BBC does well is science fiction like this, chatting. Yes, there are some wonderful model shots, and you know what? I will defend the BBC's model-making department with my dying breath. Well, not quite, but I have great respect for them. So, I will bid you farewell and speak to you very soon, probably about more Blake 7, but equally probably more about Doctor Who. So until next time, be seeing you. On the 5th of September 2015, Hooverville will return. The biggest little Doctor Who convention in the whole of the UK is proud to present several fantastic guests. First off is THE Colin Baker, a man who needs absolutely no introduction. Guests also include the author Jenny Colgan, responsible for Dark Horizons and Time Trips, Richard Marson, the man behind JNT, The Life and Scandalous Times, and the brand new book Drama and Delight, the biography of Verity Lambert, Dan Starkey, the man behind the mask when it comes to Commander Strax, and of course Ian the Elf in the Christmas special. Terence Dix, one of the men behind the third Doctor, and more target novelizations than you can shake a stick at. The actor David Benson, from Robot of Sherwood, Iris Wildheim, and the Scarifiers. Matthew Waterhouse, yes, Adric. Michael Pickwood, the current production manager on Doctor Who. And Karen Louise Hollis, author of The Man Behind the Master, the biography of Anthony Inley. More guests may be added, but either way, that's a fantastic lineup. Visit the Derby Quad website on www.derbyquad.co.uk and follow the links. Saturday, the 5th of September 2015. See you there. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast, available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise, or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. 
the Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. Mm-hmm.